Our reading this morning is taken from John chapter 20 and it's found on page 1089 in the Pew Bible. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realise that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that first day of the week, When the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Amen. Let me pray for us as we come to God's word this morning.
Father, these are familiar stories to us, a resurrected story. And we pray, Father, today that by your Holy Spirit that you'll help us to see more of Jesus' glory, more of the significance of his death and resurrection, both for our own lives, but more importantly, for your glory and honor. Lord, show us Jesus this morning, we pray, for we ask it in his name. Amen. Amen. On Monday, just past the 10th of April, at the beginning of Holy Week, both the Telegraph newspaper and the Independent both ran with a similar story with the following headline caption. It said this, a quarter of Christians do not believe in the resurrection. It was a Palm Sunday poll for the BBC which found that 23% of those calling themselves to be Christians do not believe in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead at all. And I guess the caption and the poll is a bit alarming because it says Christians don't believe in the resurrection. And I suppose that's a bit alarming, but, but the reality is, isn't it, that there are many people who struggle to understand, let alone believe in the resurrection of Jesus today. And you may be here this morning going, yeah, I don't really buy into it. And for most of us, we have and we know a neighbor next door or a colleague at work or a friend at college or school who would, on a basic level, have questions about the resurrection of Jesus if they haven't already dismissed it completely as a myth or a lie or some sort of naive belief system. And this morning, as we come to John chapter 20 of the gospel, we're going to be looking into the account of the resurrection of Jesus. And the first thing to say about the resurrection account is that Jesus' own followers were not expecting him to be raised from the dead. They were not expecting the resurrection of Jesus. If you were there, you would, you would have thought, perhaps, that they, if they were believing that Jesus would ra- be raised from the dead, that they'd be queuing up outside the tomb. It's a bit like when, you know, you two had their announcement with the, mu- with the concert this summer. I tried to get tickets, but impossible. But that's what it was like. It's like the announcement. They're having a tour, and then all these mad people queued for two days outside, anticipating, expecting to get tickets. And it's almost like that. If the disciples of Jesus really believed the resurrection, why weren't they queuing outside the tomb, waiting for him to appear, waiting for him to be resurrected? But that's not what happened with Jesus' followers. They're not in sleeping bags outside the tomb waiting for him to appear. And we can assume that Jesus' followers, those disciples who scattered when he was arrested, we can assume just what they were doing is from chapter 20, verse 19. They were together, fearful, doors locked, perhaps thinking that the Romans and the Jews were going to get them now that their leader had gone. The followers of Jesus were not expecting him to be raised from the dead, despite the fact that he told them he would be arrested, he would be killed, and after three days rise again. He told them that, but they were not expecting a resurrection of Jesus. And so the theory that Jesus' disciples had robbed the body of Jesus so that they could claim he was raised from the dead, it just doesn't stack up, it doesn't work. Because the Gospels are, are straight up with us and they are telling us these disciples were fearful. They were locked in a room. They were not expecting the resurrection of Jesus. And so a theory that says they robbed Jesus' body to claim that he had raised just doesn't stack up. The Gospel account tells us these disciples were terrified. They were mourning the loss of their leader. In their eyes, he was dead. He was executed, gone their lack of anticipation, their rationale that when death comes, it is final, it is inevitable. And folks, it's been the same way since, hasn't it? And even in our lives here on earth, death has always been the great nemesis of humanity. And so the disciples believe that death has brought a finality to Jesus. The end of it is there. But let's see what happens. Because we come to the empty tomb of verses 1 to 9, of John chapter 20. 
because on the first day of the week, early in the morning, the break of day, Mary Magdalene, and according to the other Gospels, some other women come to the tomb of Jesus, probably to anoint his body with perfume and spices. The stone has been removed. And Mary, in verse 2, do you see, it goes running to Simon, Peter, and John and says to them, the end of verse 2, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. She's not expecting a resurrection, but rather her concern is that Jesus' dead body has been taken away, removed, put somewhere, taken from the burial site. The tomb is empty. In those days, it wouldn't have been uncommon for grave robbers to come and take the body and any possessions that were buried with bodies in those days. But it is highly unlikely for grave robbers to do the following in verses 5 and 7, isn't it? Strips of linen, unwrapping of the body, and even the detail that John says that they folded. My mum had her house robbed a couple, two years ago. Grave robbers and robbers don't leave tidy messes behind. I think it took her two days to tidy up after him. Every drawer in the house was pulled out. Every content from every drawer was pulled onto the floor. And here we have, yes, grave robbers in Jesus' day, but do grave robbers unravel the linen from the body? Do they neatly fold it and leave it there? And this is what has happened. They're not that tidy. They turn everything upside down. And here, Peter and John, on hearing about the empty tomb from Mary, run to it. John, being the younger of the disciples, gets there first, but doesn't go in until Peter arrives and enters the tomb. And when Peter enters it, then John goes in after him. And the end of verse 8 says, they saw and believed. And yet verse 9 tells us, very honestly, they still didn't understand from the scriptures that Jesus had to rise from the dead. They still were not fully getting it. If you get an opportunity, maybe over this next couple of weeks, Read Matthew and Mark and Luke's account of the resurrection. But as you look into the four Gospels accounts, bear in mind the following. And can I encourage and probably recommend to you this little tiny book called The Final Days of Jesus, which maps out the week of Jesus' life on, from Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, all the way through till Sunday. And it gets the four accounts for you. It's an excellent little book. But Andres Kostenberger in his book says this, while the Gospel narratives are different, they're not contradictory. They reflect exactly what we would expect from eyewitness accounts of such unexpected supernatural events. Their very difference confirm the truthfulness of the resurrection. He goes on to say this. He says, if the disciples had stolen the body and created a conspiracy to deceive the masses, they surely would have created more uniform accounts and they most certainly would not have posted women as the first eyewitnesses. He then says this, with the next slide, he says, in the first century Palestine, the testimony of women was easily dismissed and carried little weight. The Gospel of John and the other Gospels are giving us different angles, perspectives on the resurrection of Jesus so that we would see its truth and believe in it. And this morning, John has a particular angle, a particular perspective on it. He tells us that Mary and some women were the first eyewitness accounts. He tells us that the tomb is empty, that the disciples were not expecting the resurrection. And so they still didn't understand from Scripture that he had to rise from the dead. And folks, there's no better way to be convinced of the resurrection than by seeing the dramatic impact and significant difference it makes when the risen Lord Jesus is encountered by other people. And this morning, for the rest of our time in this passage, we're going to see three encounters that the risen Lord Jesus has with people. The first encounter, follow with me, is this, the risen Lord Jesus and Mary, verses 10 to 18. Mary stays behind at the tomb after Peter and John return to their home. Look at her emotional state, verse 10. Mary stood outside the tomb and she wept. Why is she weeping? He's dead. Her master, her teacher is gone. The one in which they had such great hopes for is gone. But in the midst of her teary eyes, she bent over into the tomb. And there are two angels in the tomb. One seated where Jesus had been, where his head had been, and the other at the foot. 
Maybe you're here this morning and you go, angels, come on. You know, I'm not into that kind of crack. This is where I kind of rationalize it. God coming into the world is going to be supernatural. When he came on his birth, angels hurled it in his birth. This was God coming into the world. When he dies and he's raised to life, angels appear again, hurling in the fact that he is risen from the dead. It is a supernatural, majestic, earth-shattering moment when God comes into the world and when God is raised from life. And so why wouldn't his angels, the hosts of heaven, which we don't see, why wouldn't they be there? And they ask Mary then, the angels say to him, why are you crying, Mary? Why am I crying? Notice Mary's concern in verse 13. It's not again a belief that Jesus has risen, but rather she's concerned that the dead body of Jesus has been taken away. They've taken her Lord away, and she doesn't know where they've placed him. And in verses 14 to 16, the risen Lord Jesus meets Mary. She doesn't realize it's him at first. That's a bit strange, isn't it? And just a point to note here, that the resurrected Jesus, his risen body, is indeed physical. Jesus is not some Casper the ghost going around type figure, but there's something that brings a continuity with the, before his death, his body, and his post-resurrection body. There's a continuity there, because when they meet with him, they recognize him. But then there are other times in the gospel when, they, when they're not shown who he is, or he does something that is actually supernatural again by entering a room. And folks, the reality is we have no idea what a resurrected body looks like. You have no idea what a resurrected body looks like. You may say to yourself, this can't be true. How can a man come into the room if he's both physical and not? We have no idea. I looked in the mirror this morning. I'm getting grayer by the moment. My body is getting older. I'm putting on weight where I don't want to have weight. And that's true for all of us. We have dying bodies. And we have no idea what a resurrected body is. And yet in Jesus, the one who was raised to life, we have a physical resurrected body. And tonight, if you want to find out more about what that might look like, come to 1 Corinthians 15 at our evening service, because it tells us that if Christ is raised, then we are raised. And then the great hope of the resurrection is that when you die as a believer in Christ, you will be raised to life, your body will be raised to life, that you'll have a physical body again, because Jesus was raised with a physical body. But there's a mystery here. There's an understanding that we cannot fathom when it comes to the body of Jesus. And Jesus asks Mary a similar question to what the angels asked her. Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? And Mary thinks he's the gardener. She says to him, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. Again, she's thinking of a dead Jesus, a body which can be carried away, put somewhere. And when Jesus says to her, Mary, with that she turns around and she cries out, teacher. And Matthew's gospel tells us she worshipped him, fell at his feet, clasped his feet. Jesus utters her name and she recognizes her master's voice. But isn't that what Jesus said in John 10? He said this, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. They listen to my voice. And in verses 17 and 18, do you see it there? Jesus reminds Mary, don't cling to me because I'm returning to my father and your father, to my God and your God. And Mary goes and tells the disciples, I have seen the Lord. Folks, this morning, Jesus is risen and it changes everything. It changed Mary's mourning and despair, her sorrow, into joy and worship. She was devastated by the loss of her teacher, her Lord. Death had seemingly again had the final word on Jesus of Nazareth. But you know something, folks? Death never has the final word when it comes to the resurrected Jesus. And yet because Jesus rose from the dead, it changes everything. Mourning turns to gladness, crying to worship. And that is the kind of hope that the resurrection of Jesus brings, not just to Mary, but also to us here today.
that he takes the elements of death that bring that mourning and grief and the resurrection changes it it brings a joy it brings a worship because he has defeated sin and death at the cross of calvary he paid our debt of sin and now there's access to god again and that's why mary jesus says to mary i'm returning to my father and your father to my god and your god folks if you put your trust in the lord jesus to rescue you from your sin you're united with him meaning that god the father becomes your god and your father and that is why jesus says this and if jesus is only dead and there is no resurrection then there is no gladness there is no joy there is no way to know god as father but if it's true if the resurrection is true it changes everything the second counter is between jesus the risen jesus and his disciples verses 19 to 23 it's now the evening time do you see it there on the first day of the week and we find the disciples hid behind locked doors here are those followers of jesus who he called by name who he spent the last three years with they are the ones who abandoned him they are the future leaders of god's church and they're fearful they're afraid fear has gripped them and understandably so what does the future hold do they return to their jobs and their homes after three years of investing in the hope that this man was the messiah their master has been cruelly killed are they next on the hit list of the jews and yet into the middle of the fear comes the risen jesus and in verse 19 he stood among them and it says in verse 19 peace be with you and jesus will repeat this greeting peace be with you in verses 21 and 26 when he stands amongst them and i love the way carson puts this in his commentary about this peace this greeting he says shalom peace on easter evening is the complement of it is finished on the cross for the peace of reconciliation and life from god is now imparted jesus words on the cross on good friday that we had two days ago he said it is finished complete and now the resurrected jesus says to his followers who are fearful peace to you restored relationship with god that peace is life with him because of jesus death and resurrection folks most of us have fears don't we most of us deep down have deep-seated fear in our life but our greatest fear is this isn't it our greatest fear is what will happen after i die most of us fear that we don't have an answer sometimes for that and because of the resurrection of jesus there is for those who put their trust and their life in him peace life and hope and that is what jesus is doing here with his disciples and their fear the risen jesus is bringing the peace of god but he's also doing two more things he's sending them out in verses in the verse do you see it we're familiar with this idea of sending out you do it for a missionary or a summer team and here in verse 21 jesus is sending his disciples to continue the mission that he continues and again carson puts it like this he says this christ's disciples do not take over jesus's mission his mission continues and is effective in their ministry and jesus earlier spoke to the disciples about continuing the work that the father had continued for them to do and the resurrection makes this possible they are going to continue making god known making christ known but they're not left to their own devices verse 22 tells us he gives them the holy spirit as promised for john the sending out is linked with the giving of the holy spirit in acts chapter 1 and 2 we see the great empowering that the holy spirit does as the disciples continue the ministry of jesus in the book of acts as they declare the good news of the death and resurrection of jesus to a needy world the spirit empowers them we see the resurrected jesus imparting peace to his disciples they are overjoyed we see the resurrected jesus give them a purpose a sending out but also an equipping and folks even though we are not apostles or we are not apostolic in any shape or form 
the good news of the resurrected Jesus is that he continues to do this. The resurrected Jesus continues to impart peace to those who are his. To those who give their lives to him, he offers the peace with God. It is the prerogative of the risen Jesus, but he also gives us a task to be his witness at school or work or at home. He doesn't leave you on his own, though. He gives you the Spirit of God to help you, equip you, and lead you and guide you. This is the hope of the resurrection. But if there's no resurrection, there is no peace. There is no mission. Why would we need the Holy Spirit? But if there is a resurrection, then that changes everything. There is peace for you to be had. There is a life to be lived with meaning and purpose. There is the gift of the Holy Spirit to equip you in serving Jesus. The resurrection changes everything. Lastly, the third encounter is between risen Jesus and Thomas, verses 24 to 29. I'm sure many of us here this morning can identify with Thomas. He's what you might call a, a skeptic doubter, doubting Thomas. And for many of us, you're probably here this morning and thinking, you know what, I need to see things in order to believe it. I need proof, I need evidence. And so when the other disciples tell Thomas that they've seen the Lord, he wasn't there. And he tells them straight, as he did to John in John 11, Jesus, you're speaking about being the way, the truth, and life, but I have no idea how I get there. And Thomas has this knack of being straight. And in verse 25, he says to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. And Thomas is like so many today, isn't he? where we need to be able to have concretely see things in order to trust them. Don't talk to me about faith. Faith is a wishy-washy thing. And many of us think like that, or, you know, Christianity is built on a circumstantial evidence. It's not enough. I need to see it. I need to have concrete evidence. And for some of us here this morning, we may feel the same about Christianity. We're like Thomas. But there is much that has to be said of Thomas here in this passage. And in the timing and providence of God, Thomas had to wake a week later to see the risen Jesus. And then Jesus appears again amongst his disciples, and Thomas is there that time. And Jesus takes up his challenge. He says to him, Thomas, put your finger and hand into my wounds. The picture on the screen is a Caravaggio painting, which captures the moment that Peter or Thomas, well, I don't think he did it in the scriptures, but initially what it might look like of doubting Thomas putting his hand and his finger into the wounds of Jesus. And Jesus says to him, stop doubting and believe. It is literally this, don't be unbelieving, but believing Thomas. And with this, Thomas says to Jesus, my Lord and my God. Thomas has met with the resurrected Jesus and it has turned his doubting into belief. Don Carson puts it like this again. He says this, the most unyielding skeptic has become or has bequeathed to the most profound confession. My Lord and my God. And you know, folks, there are some of us here this morning who are hardened unbelievers, who are skeptic when it comes to the resurrection and to the risen Jesus. But can I encourage you this morning, take heart, because verse 29 says this to you and I this morning. Jesus said to Thomas, because you've seen, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. This morning, we have not seen the risen Lord Jesus in his physical capacity. Like Thomas, we didn't have that privilege. And yet Jesus says in this verse to Thomas, blessed are those who believe who have not seen. But how is that possible? It's only possible as John's gospel was written. See it in verse 30 and 31. It was written so that we would be crystal clear and convinced that Jesus is the Son of God and that by believing in him, we may have life in his name. You want evidence? You want to see Jesus? Read the scriptures. Read the gospel accounts because they unveil the life of Jesus, who is God himself, the Son of God. And the beauty of it is this, is that he will impart life, forgiveness of sins, 
and life eternal to you as you trust him and take hold of who he is. The word can change the doubter into an unbeliever. This morning, the resurrection is good news for the doubter, the skeptic, the person who has to see because the risen Jesus is here to be met in his word. And so we can go from doubting to unbelief. That is possible this morning on this Easter Sunday. But if there is no resurrection, there is no need to believe. There is no need for a risen Jesus. However, if it is true, the resurrection of Jesus changes everything. This morning, Jesus is risen. And because he is risen, the risen Jesus changes mourning and despair of Mary into joy and gladness. The risen Jesus changed the fear of his disciples into peace. And the risen Lord Jesus changed unbelief of Thomas to belief. And you know something, folks? He's risen today, he's alive, and he's doing the same things amongst us today. He is changing the mourning to joy, the fear to peace, the unbelief to belief. The question is, what have you done with the risen Lord Jesus? If you're a Christian here this morning, rejoice. He has done amazing work in our lives and continues to do it. If you're not, come and ask your questions. Come and explore the Gospels with us. And let's find out together whether this resurrection of Jesus changes everything. Let me pray for us this morning. Father, there's something in all of us that longs for this to be true so that we would have joy and gladness that we would have peace with you and with those around us that we would believe that this risen Jesus is indeed the son of God who came to die for us who came to give us life father there is something in us that wants to believe this but father our hearts are filled with the effects of death. We are filled with fear. We are filled with unbelief. And Lord, our prayer this morning is, help our unbelief. Help us to see Jesus and what he has done in his resurrection as life-changing, life-transforming. And we pray for those of us who have come to see him, that you will deepen our knowledge and love of him so that we will rejoice in the fact that he is risen today and that his resurrected life has made every difference in our life. Father, for those of us here this morning who are skeptical, who are doubting, Father, help us to see Jesus. Help us to investigate his word. Help us to meet Jesus in the pages of scripture so that we may know him, the son of God who gave his life for us so that we might live. Father, this morning, we praise you that Jesus is risen. Lord, bless us this day and for this coming week, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.